Hey, what's up guys? I'm Jason with Upshifting Adventures and first things first, thank you so much for stopping by the channel, checking out this video. I truly do appreciate every viewer, every subscriber that I get. Um, like I've said many times in the past, I don't make any money really making these videos. I just do it because I love motorcycles and I hope to share my, uh, my experiences with others who might gain something from it, right? Um, so this is another video about the Husky 701. If, uh, <coughs> excuse me, if you're familiar with my channel at all, you've probably seen several of the videos that I've done on the 701, but this one is a little bit different. This is a video based or, or made for someone who is looking to buy a motorcycle as their primary mode of transportation, right? Every day, all day, where, where you know, it's how they get to where they're going. And the reason I decided to make this video is a couple days ago, I was on my way to the gym. It was about 6.15 in the morning. It was dark out, it was probably about 40, 45 degrees, it's November. Um, and next to me on the road, on, uh, you know, headed kind of the same direction I was going, was a guy on a similar style of dual sport like this one. And as I was looking at him, you know, he had kind of a street style jacket on, he had a street helmet blue jeans and some enduro boots, backpack. <clears throat> and it occurred to me that that was probably his primary mode of conveyance, right? So I wanted to do a video on this bike specifically and <clears throat> what I think about it being a primary in town um, street used vehicle, right? Now, obviously the great thing about a dual sport is you can do what you're doing with it, go to work, go to school, whatever, you know, run over to the grocery store. But then at the same time, if you want to hit the dirt, you're, you're there, right? You just get on the bike, drive to wherever your closest dirt is and hit it. So even if this is, you know, your primary go to work, go to school, what have you type of vehicle, you still have the ability to go have some fun with it, right? Out on the dirt. So, if you're looking for a bike that's going to be your primary vehicle and you're wondering about the Husqvarna 701 and how it would be, stay tuned and uh, I'll talk about that. So I think for most people, the, the primary concern they would have with getting something like the Husqvarna 701 as a daily driver, a do-it-all do kind of vehicle is the maintenance, right? I was watching a video the other day, uh, a guy had just bought the 701 and he was very apprehensive about it and, and it said that you know he had shied away from getting it all of these years because he heard about the maintenance nightmare that these uh, Austrian bikes are, right? Or you know the KTM brand. Um, he was more of a, a DRZ or a KLR style of guy, he had always owned those types of bikes kind of bike that you can just run it forever and it requires very little maintenance and it's just always there. But let's face it, those things are not performing vehicles at all, right? They're, they just kind of, they tractor up, up hills and stuff and um, they're just not a whole lot of fun to ride, honestly. So he was concerned about the maintenance on this bike. And we will get into the maintenance here in a little bit. Uh, but I think the first thing that we need to talk about when it comes to whether this bike here, it would be good as an everyday vehicle. There's a few factors that go into that, right? How does it drive on the street? Does it have the acceleration from light to light to keep up with the other cars? Um, does it stop well? Does it handle well around corners? Uh, if you're driving on city streets, you're gonna be doing a lot of lefts and rights around corners, right? Um, not only that, is it configurable to your style of riding, what you're gonna be doing with it? Meaning, can you put bags on it? Um, it, it will it um, accept a lot of different um, features, right? <clears throat> the short answer to that is yes. This bike, my, my personal 701, has I have put a lot of upgrades on it. But what I want to talk about first is how it performs bone stock from the factory. Okay, so let's talk about the motor on this bike, right? It is a 690, almost 3cc uh, single cylinder motor. So it's a thumper engine. Um, 
it makes roughly 75 horsepower at 8,500 RPM and about 60, I think 62 pounds of torque at about 6,000 RPM, all right? Um, very capable, very strong motor, right? By comparison, the latest version of the KLR, I think was making somewhere in the 40 horsepower range, okay? So this is a performance oriented vehicle for sure. The thing that I noticed first when I bought this bike was that from idle, the, the engine had almost no power. I was very unimpressed um, with it. Now that being said, once you hit uh, the mid range of the power band, it takes off like a rocket. This thing has so much power in the high, uh, high end of the RPM range, right? So one thing that causes also is you have to shift a lot, right? Because you're going to get to that high, uh, you're going to get to that mid to high portion of the RPM range. You're going to hit all that power. Well, now it's time to shift again. So for city street use, um, just to be perfectly honest, it does, you know, that is a factor, right? Uh, you are going to be shifting a lot. That being said, the clutch on this bike, I think is fan fantastic is super super buttery smooth um, takes very little effort to engage the clutch um, so that is a good thing right if you're going to be shifting a lot at least you're not going to wear out your, your forearm doing that um, one question i always get is have you swapped out the clutch slave cylinder um, and i i say no i've had no problems with this clutch whatsoever and everybody says well good luck because you will right so i have decided uh, i have a, a, a magura style um clutch slave cylinder on order from uh, rottweiler performance it's in the mail it's going to get here i figured you know what if everybody says that that is the weak point in the drive line of this bike might as well swap that guy out before it becomes a problem right so uh, I'll be doing that shortly. What, look for the video on that. I'll be putting that out here in uh, in, in a little bit, and um, that way I, I just don't have to worry about the, the clutch going out on me, um, like many of the people with this bike have said. Okay, um, the 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 most issue I've seen with people uh, having problems with this bike, uh, I've heard about the clutch slave. But mostly what I've seen is the bike overheating, which I think kind of rolls into the maintenance of the bike, right? This, this bike is meant to run at the top of the RPM range. It likes to be ring out um, and, you know, it's, it's a seat of your pants kind of fun kind of bike, right? Well, when you do that, you got to be sure to do the maintenance. Um, you know, a lot of people are very meticulous about changing the oil. And, and keeping keep, keeping nice, good, clean oil in their motor, but they tend to skip the coolant. Um, so what I do is every every time I change the oil, I change the coolant as well. It's just not that expensive, uh, and it's good peace of mind, good insurance that the that the bike's going to keep running. Right. This particular bike is very simple to change the coolant on. There is a um, a drain plug at the front of the motor, bottom front of the motor, you un undo it, pop off the radiator cap, let it drain. You can use some distilled water to flush it if you wanted to, but I do that every two or three times. Excuse me, but uh, yeah, you just put the plug back in, fill it back up with fluid, and you're off to the races. So um, a very cost-effective way to have good peace of mind, if you ask me. <clears throat> with respect to changing the oil, I can't think of any other bike that I've ever owned or even heard of that has quite the procedure for changing oil that this bike does. Um, now, you know, there, there is, there are two fuel or two oil filters on this bike. Uh, one on the left side, one on the right side. There are two oil screens that have to be maintained as well. One on the bottom left of the case and one in the front of the motor itself. The oil screens don't have to be changed out every time you do the oil. You just pull them out and spray them down with some contact cleaner and clean them out a little bit and uh, just put them back in. Now you probably don't even have to do that every oil change, but I, I think the schedule maintenance, the first maintenance on this bike is 6,000 
uh, miles, and that is to pull the cover off and check the valve lash, um, as well as the oil change and all that. With respect to valve lash, I actually have talked to a few people who have gotten uh, 18 to 20, even more, 22,000 miles out of their uh, 701 before they had to actually have the valve lash adjusted. Now, yes, you have to bring it in and, and have the case pulled off and, uh, or the cover pulled off and checked, uh, but that's peace of mind, right? But it doesn't mean that they have to be adjusted every 6,000 miles. So that's kind of a misnomer that's out there. Oh, the Husky has to be adjusted every 6,000 miles. And I don't think that's true. And I don't think that's very common, to be quite honest with you. Now, with respect to the oil, uh, again, this bike is ridden at the high end of the RPM range. And you are ringing it out if you're, if you're truly enjoying riding this bike. Uh, I will sometimes, if I, if I go out and uh, I'm just tearing it up for 1,000 miles, I come home and change the oil. Uh, sometimes two or three thousand miles it just depends on how I'm riding but if I am really really putting a lot of load on the motor putting it under a lot of stress you know just come home change the oil it's not that hard it's a bit more of a process than most but it's really not all that difficult right okay so we've talked about the motor and the maintenance on the bike now let's talk about what it's like riding it on the street okay um, one of the biggest factors, like I said, the motor, it does kind of lag off idle, but not too bad. It's not horrible, right? So that's, to me, that's not really a factor. That's not going to turn me off from buying a bike like this for uh, everyday use. Brakes. Uh, Single-sided brakes on front and rear, like most dirt bikes are, right? But it does have two-piston Brembo brake calipers in the front, single-piston in the rear the bike stops very, very well, okay? Uh, when I first got it, riding it on the street, what I did notice is when I'm coming up to a stop or I'm getting ready to stop, once I grab that front brake lever, the bike dives pretty, pretty quick, right? But once it gets into the stroke, it really smooths out. Uh, so it's not like the bike is herky-jerky or uh, bouncing all over the place as you come to a stop. It's just that initial dive, and then as it gets into the stroke, uh, the compression uh, kicks in and it's very smooth. The bike stops quick. Um, when you start the vehicle, or when you start the motorcycle, two things: uh, the, your traction control and your ABS are on. Right now, there's a way to turn them off, but just know that when you're riding this bike, every time you start turn this bike off and start it back up again, it goes right back to default to having traction control on and ABS on. Um, when you turn the ABS off, it's not a uh, horrible thing to do. You just push the ABS button on the front there for four seconds. It will light up, uh, letting you know that ABS is no longer active. Now what that does is it turns off the ABS on the back tire so you can block the back wheel, but the front wheel still has ABS. It will always have ABS. Um, there are two maps on this bike, one for street riding, one for off-road riding. If you're in the off-road map or map two and you turn ABS off, then the front ABS becomes a little less sensitive. So you don't get as quick an engagement with the ABS. Um, we're not gonna talk much about that though because this is really for the street riding uh, guy that's gonna use this every day in, in town. The ABS is very good on this bike. Uh, when you hit the, the back brake, you will feel that ABS uh, surging pretty quickly. Um, I personally don't have any issue with ABS while riding around in town. So many times, you know, you look, you weren't paying attention. You look up, oh, crud, there's a bunch of cars stopped in front of you. You grab a handful of brakes. Um, you know, if you're not using ABS, there is always that possibility of the front wheel washing out or even worse, you know, you, you, uh, you do a stoppy and go flying right over your handlebars, right? So ABS, awesome. This ABS, is very good now these bikes the newer generations are also equipped with you know the full electronics package where when you're leaning and you're braking and the bike is sensing what's going on right so you can't you know get on the brakes as you're going around a corner and just lock up the the wheel it's very very stable platform okay let's talk about the shocks the shocks on the on this bike are uh, WP, which of course is is KTM's uh, in in-house brand of shocks, and these are the Explorers. Um, 
very good shocks. I like them a lot. They are very smooth. Um, they are very plush, uh, and they are fully adjustable on the top of the forks here for both your rebound and your compression, so you can dial them into just how you like to ride them. Uh, also, a, a WP shock in the rear, uh, fully adjustable for, uh, for your sag and all that other stuff, right? Um, very good setup, a, a very, very good setup. Now, since we're talking about riding this bike in the street and, and, and you know, being a primary mover for us, it has to be said that the, the 701 seat from the factory, just like almost all factory seats, it is junk, totally sucks. I'm sorry, Husky, but your seat sucks. Uh, but they're not the other ones, right? Nobody puts good seats on their bikes for whatever reason. So I bought a Seat Concepts um, seat. This seat is, one, it's the taller seat, and two, Seat Concepts also makes a wider uh, seat that you can buy where the back end gets wider so you can sit back here on longer trips down the freeway or whatever and it is very very comfortable narrow like stock in the front and grippy uh, it is also a direct fit there's no modifications needed uh, they do provide you with a, uh, a little bit of a washer for um, uh, no pardon me that's for uh, my other KTM seat there uh, but seats, seat concepts, everybody knows them. They are fantastic seats, really make great stuff, okay? This bike is a tall bike. Uh, I'm six foot four, and it is perfectly, the perfect height for me with this seat on it. If you are six foot tall or under, they do make a lowering link for the swing arm that you would probably want to install on the bike. And if you do that, you're also gonna have to replace, probably have to replace the kickstand for a shorter kickstand. Um, or else the bike's going to be almost straight up and down when you're when you're on the kickstand. Okay. Uh, the bike does come with rear foot pegs, uh, so if you do have a passenger that you want to put on here, they have somewhere to put their feet, and that's kind of nice. A um, little bit of a, a you know a nice touch from them to put those on there. Okay. The one thing about this bike that almost everybody notices. Uh, it does not come with a steering damper. This particular motorcycle though is very prone to speed wobbles at around 70 to 80 miles an hour. I mean, really prone to them, especially, you know, depending on where you're sitting on the bike, it could be uh, worse or better. Uh, there are a couple of things. One guy I was talking to suggested balancing the front tire and that that helps quite a bit. Uh, that's a good idea. I don't balance them. I, I ride this mostly if I'm on the street I'm headed to the dirt. This is my, one of my favorite back back road dirt riding uh, motorcycles uh, So I have not balanced my front wheel The most common uh, solution to that problem is to put a steering damper on the bike and The most common steering damper that I've seen is the Scots and it's a really good steering damper but you have to buy the damper and then you have to buy all the adapter hardware to mount it to this motorcycle and in the end you're looking at about $800. Um, I just, it doesn't bother me enough that I would, I want to spend that money on a steering, steering damper. I'd rather spend that money somewhere else on the bike. Now what I would do, what I would suggest if you were going to use this bike primarily for city driving or commuting uh, is I would lower the triple tree down on the forks an additional three millimeters over the third ring on here so just lowering it a few millimeters i think would clean it up quite a bit make it a much more um, um much more stable bike at, at higher uh higher speeds right otherwise you know if it doesn't bother you great uh, I, it doesn't bother me i get some speed wobbles i just let off the gas uh, and it, and it cures right up, so it's not a, a super huge um, concern, okay? Uh, so let's talk about mods for the bike. Uh, mostly, like I was saying, um, luggage, right? Just about every major company out there makes luggage packages or options for this bike. So on the back of this one here, I've got a Tusk rack that I mounted on it. It is capable of uh, mounting some of the smaller tank, or not tank bags, but tail bags, stuff like that. I use it, I have a Moscow Moto Reckless 40 that I drape over the, um, over, 
the rack here that instead of being over the back seat, it keeps the it keeps the um, the sides of the bags from hitting the back of my legs. Right. It also gets it away from the gas cap, so I can I can fill up without having to um, take my bags off. Um, I have a uh, Giant Loop Diablo tank bag. It's a six liter tank bag that fits right up on top of this thing just perfectly. And um, it doesn't get in my way at all. And it's great for just, you know, for if I'm just doing a day ride, I can put just about everything I need in there for a day ride. Uh, if you're using it every day, you can put all those essentials in there that, uh, that you want. And, you know, you've always got them with you. So that's, that's really cool. Um, well, let me back up a little bit and talk a little bit uh, about the gas tank on this bike, all right? So the gas tank on this bike and on the KTM 690, which is uh, unique to those two bikes, is in the back, okay? They mounted it uh, to the back of the frame here with a poly something or other space age hardened plastic, you know, and it's very secure. It's not, I don't, it's not an issue at all, but it does put the weight uh, more lower on the bike, okay, and more towards the rear makes it very maneuverable. Um, however, I think that it contributes to the high speed, uh, the higher mile per hour speed wobbles because you are taking all the weight and you're putting it to the back of the bike. Now the Husqvarna engineers or the KTM engineers and some of the leading experts in the field may disagree with me, but to me it stands to reason you put all the weight in the back, you lighten up the front, that's gonna increase your, your, your um, uh, prevalence of getting speed wobbles. So. Who knows? Um, one thing about this bike with having the, the gas tank back here and it being a thumper motor, right? A, a single cylinder motor as, a, as opposed to like the, um, uh, the Tenere 700 uh, or some of like the KTM uh, uh, in, or, or uh, parallel twin adventure bikes. Because of the gas tank and the single cylinder motor, this bike is very, very maneuverable, which really is an advantage when riding around in town, right? Uh, so I love riding this bike around town. In fact, usually if, uh, if I got to go to the grocery store or something like that, just pick up a few things, I will always just jump on this bike and go over there because it's so much fun to ride. Um, and a lot of obstacles, you know, that uh, would would you know, hinder a street bike or a vehicle, you don't have with this. You, you get to go some places you can't do that with other, other types of vehicles, right? So to me, totally awesome. I love riding it. Um, okay, so speaking of, you know, I mentioned earlier on in the video that this bike has some um, power, off idle power sluggishness. But that can certainly be cured, and I, I cured it uh, on this bike for sure, and I think I chose the right way to do it. Now, what I'm going to do is talk about the modifications I've done to the bike performance uh, mods, or I should say power adding mods, and then we'll get into all the other mods that I've done on the bike so far. The first thing I did was I replaced the uh, factory exhaust. Okay, I went with a Tecmo head pipe and an aero slip-on for this bike. And the reason I went with the Tecmo header, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, is when I first bought the exhaust, I bought an aero head pipe and I bought an aero exhaust. And I also bought a Power Commander and an auto-tune for the bike. The auto-tune is basically, uh, a, it, what it does is it makes all corrections to the fueling and advance and, and, and I'm sorry, to the fueling of the bike in real time, right? So wherever your hand is on the throttle, whatever gear you're in, whether you're ascending, descending hills, barometric pressure, the temperature, it makes all these changes in real time. And it's a really, really awesome um, um, feature, but it comes with a new O2 sensor. The O2 sensor on the Auto-Tune is an 18 millimeter threaded O2 sensor. The factory O2 sensor is a 12 millimeter. So when I bought the Aero head pipe, it came with a 12 millimeter O2 bung because that's what the factory O2 is. 
And I thought, well, man, now I got to take this brand new $400 head pipe and have it machined to accept the 18 millimeter um, O2 sensor from the auto tune. Well, Tecmo, they come with an 18 millimeter bung on the head pipe. All right. Now, if you don't plan to run, <clears throat> excuse me, an auto tune just yet, but you may do that in the future. The great thing about the Tecmo header is it comes also with a, uh, a 12 millimeter adapter that screws into the bung and then you can use your factory O2 sensor. So if you only want to do the exhaust for now or even the exhaust in a power commander but you're not sure about the auto tune, if you go with the Tecmo header and you decide later on to upgrade to the auto tune, all you do is take that o the factory O2 sensor out, uh, unscrew the adapter and screw the new O2 sensor right into the head pipe. So that is a, is a really great um, way to go if you ask me. Okay, so when I replaced the exhaust and uh, put in the Power Commander and the Auto Tune, I instantly noticed the roll-on power right off of idle. It changed, it changed the bike a thousand percent from that low RPM kind of lug before it hits that mid-range. Uh, to something that has pulse strong all the way through the RPM range. Um, you know, people will talk about the, the T7 or the Tenere 700 motor, that it's a very linear power producing motor. This is not out of the factory because it's meant to be run at the high RPM range, right? But after making those mods, it really cleaned it up and it has great pull from start to finish now. So I'm very, very super happy with this bike uh, and the power that it makes. Um, one other thing I did to help the acceleration is uh, I was out in Ure, I don't know, a few months back, and I noticed that, you know, coming around switchbacks and going straight up some steep climbs at 12,000, 10,000 feet, it was really bogging down. So I added um, a Dirt Tricks 48 tooth rear sprocket uh, over the 46 tooth factory sprocket. One, it's got, it's, it's two bigger teeth. Uh, and two, it's about half the weight of the factory sprocket. So that really also helped that you know, initial off the line uh, power for the bike. I also added a super light front sprocket, but I stayed with the factory or the OEM 16 tooth uh, front sprocket and uh, a DID gold series chain, which I just, I always put DID chains on, on my bikes. Um, so that is kind of the, the drive line and, and performance upgrades that I've done to the bike so far. The other thing that I'm going to do is, um, I, I already ordered it, it's on the way. I am going to replace, or I'm going to delete the secondary air system and the EVAP canister with a delete kit from Rottweiler Performance. Um, I also ordered a a new intake system from Rottweiler for the bike as well. This whole thing up here, this air box, is just a huge waste of space, number one. Number two, it is a pain in the ass if you have to take it out, and it's even worse if you have to put it back in. So I'm gonna get rid of the air box, put a good uh, uh, performance air filter on this, um, and I should get some power gains out of that as well. I'm almost certain I will not get any power gains from the air, from the secondary air system, and evap canister deletes, but what it will do is it'll make it a more efficient system uh, for, for the air intake, right? You can get a one gallon uh, fuel cell that can sit in here in place of the old um, air box, or I what I opted for was a um, like a one gallon a bag that goes in there. I can put my registration, some gloves, you know, some snacks, a few other things or whatever like that and keep those in there. Uh, because I've always carried, I just carry extra fuel with me anyways. I didn't need that, that one, one gallon fuel uh, cell for this bike. Um, I'll be doing a video on that when I do the, uh, the new air intake and the SAS and EVAP canister deletes. So keep an eye out for that if you're interested in doing that. A um, couple of other things that I've done. So when I first got the bike, I took it out to Moab. Uh, I was on Schaefer Trail. I was in some kind of loose, little pebbly ground and I wasn't paying attention and it kind of pulled me off to the side and I laid it down in a ditch off to the side of the road on the right side. 
uh, the flags that come on this bike, they're junk. Uh, broke the um, the brake the brake lever, and so I decided to put this these these Cycra um, wraparound handguards on her. And these guys are super tough. Uh, they're not going anywhere, and and I'm really really happy with them. Also pertaining to that, when I, I've dropped this bike, including that time, uh, one other time on its right side, never in a, you know high speed or anything, I but just laid it down over on its right side. And both times I completely tacoed the brake lever or uh, the brake pedal. So I, I opted to go with a set of um, Van Esch billet aluminum brake lever and shift lever. I've also got Van Esch uh, foot pegs on here. They're the wide foot pegs, which I really like, but they, and they also have the little steel inserts, the cleats that you can adjust. They're super, super grippy and uh, really, really happy with those. I put a Van Esch, um, gas cap and, and filler on on the bike the factory filler cap had a, a recess around the outside of it to where dirt and stuff would would build up and could end up getting into the fuel cell and fouling up your fuel line so uh, i just decided to do this one it doesn't have a key so it's just a spin off which i, I prefer uh, so it's not only performance oriented but it looks great that's a twofer right can't can't pass that up uh, i also put on a set of motor tech Outback crash guards, but if you're running this primarily on the street, maybe you don't need crash guards. Um, and if you want just a little bit of peace of mind, you can get the uh, you know sliders that you can buy for these too. The factory uh, skid plate, like all manufacturers, is cheap, so I replaced it with a good heavy-duty skid plate. Again, if you're riding this on the road, you might not even care about a skid plate. Um, let's see what else. Um, I put a BRP chain guide on it and a Van Esch case saver, which looks really, really cool. So um, I like that. I, I will, uh, at some point, I plan to put uh, some bead lockers in the, uh, uh, not, not bead lockers, rim locks in the, the wheels, but that's not really high on my list right now. So um, we'll see what happens with that. <clears throat> So I've got this really nice looking uh, carbon fiber heat shield that I bought from Tecmo to, to go on the head pipe there. Um, I thought, man, it looked really, really sweet, so I bought it. But what I will say is the first time your boot heel hits that thing, scuffs it up and, and it's done. You can't get the scuffs out of it, right? So uh, I'm more of a performance guy over an aesthetics guy. If I had to do it all over again, I'd probably just leave the aluminum heat shield on there. But it wasn't all that much. I think it was like 80 bucks. And if you're riding it in town and you're not doing off-road riding, you may not have to worry about that. You may not ever scuff it up, and it does provide you know a pretty pretty sexy look to the exhaust system there. So kind of worth it in that regard, right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's really about it on on the bike. Let's, uh, let's go get it out on the street, take it for a ride, and see how it performs just driving on your average kind of city streets. And then we'll, uh, I'll get back and we'll talk a little bit more about it. One of the first things I noticed when I started riding the 701 was that the, the power band was really, really high in the RPM range, right? So like mid to upper RPM range. Um, down low, it really didn't have much, which, which led to the second thing that, that I found uh, with the bike was that I was constantly having to shift, right? Because if you weren't in the right gear, you weren't going to be going anywhere, really. Now, that changed when I added the Power Commander, the Auto-Tune, and the new exhaust. So, now the bike really has great pull from, um, you know, idle all the way through uh, um, high RPMs.
So that was just a roll on uh, wheelie. I, I didn't even really give it much gas. Uh, it wasn't a clutch up, it was just a power up. The, uh, the seat that I'm running on this bike is a seat concepts. Uh, it's the tall seat and it's the wide seat and it's very comfortable. Um, I, I could definitely, you know, if I was just out and about in town all day long on this thing, I would have no problem uh, just zipping around town all day long, going from place to place, running errands, whatever. Uh, and I could do that for quite some time. Now, if I was going to use this bike almost, you know, exclusively for commuting, which, let me be honest, I mean, I, I think it is a viable option. Um, I'm six foot four and, you know, I'm about 240 pounds. So it's not the ideal bike for me as a commuter bike, but I could do it. Um, and I think the average person, the average height and weight person probably would, uh, would be really comfortable on this bike. So, where was I going? Oh, yeah. So, at any rate, uh, the tires that came on it were TKC80s. I'm not a fan of the TKC80s. Uh, I replaced them with the Dunlop 606s, which uh, they, they do pretty well on the street, but I, I want this as a true dual sport. I will never use this mostly as a street rider. So, I wanted the 606s because I wanted a, more of a dirt tire than a street tire, which they are not street tires, but they actually handle pretty well. Um, a little bit, uh, they do vibrate a little bit for sure, as you would expect. Uh, but if you were to put a set of, uh, a different set of tire, you know, choose your brand or whatever you prefer as far as a adventure tire or a dual sport tire on this bike, that's more maybe a, a 60-40 or a 70-30, it would be really comfortable to ride around all day long. Now, the Husky is a tall bike, okay? I'm six foot four, like I said, and at a stop, I, it's, I cannot always, depending on, you know, the ground underneath me, if it's a little bit of a slope, I cannot always get both feet flat, feet, flat on the ground, you know, even at my height. Um, the guy that I bought it from, well, I bought it from a dealer, but uh, the previous owner, he only had it, you know, he had 500 miles on it. Um, and he put a lowering link in it. So I asked him, of course, to take that out. Uh, but if you are, if you're under six foot tall, you are almost certainly gonna want a lowering link um, to, to own this bike. being pretty gentle on the throttle here. I'm not giving it a lot of gas. Um, and it, it runs at, you know, surface street speeds with no problems whatsoever. Um, oh yeah, so one thing I was going to say is if you were going to use this as primarily a commuter with the occasional trips out to the dirt or whatever, uh, I would certainly uh, I don't know if you'd want to spend your money on a new triple tree or nothing like that, but I would I would for sure lower the front end at least two or three millimeters uh, over the lowest line on the shock or excuse me on the forks because this bike does have the tendency to get speed wobbles um, either a at you know high speeds around. 70 or 80 miles an hour or uh, on hard acceleration it will get speed wobbles on you especially if you if you're hitting the gas hard enough that the light the front end is light 
Um, but since I primarily, you know, I want this as a true dual sport, mostly leaning towards dirt riding, I'm not going to mess with that. So the brakes, Brembo brakes, um, and they stop really well, as you would expect from a set of Brembos. Uh, you know, the front the front wheel only has it's only a one-sided disc. It's not two-sided. It's not a street bike, um, but it does stop the bike well. If you you know, I usually turn the traction control off because I like to do wheelies every now and then, of course. Um, and if you are running the traction control off, the back wheel will lock up on you pretty easily, especially if you're running knobbies. Uh, now with a set of, if you were running some supermoto tires or more street street oriented tires, I can't say, uh, but I imagine it would be a little less of an, an issue. Um, now the front wheel will not lock regardless, if, unless you get one of the ABS dongles, but uh, you know, so you always have front ABS, which I prefer uh, on this bike because I do not want to uh, you know, come up on something that I, I, I just wasn't paying attention and got spooked and grab a handful of front brake here and lock up the wheel. Um, it's just not not something I really am that big. You know, I don't really care. I'm, I'm fine with having ABS in the front. Uh, I do like having the ability to turn off the rear ABS, especially on the dirt. Of course, anybody who rides dirt, you know, knows that you want to be able to block that rear tire. Um, so, engine vibration. I have heard a lot of people talk about how uh, vibratory, if you will, the motor is. Okay, I mean it's a it's a 600 and uh, you know what 90 something cc single cylinder. Um, that is a big slab of metal going up and down. Um, so, you know, that being the case, it's not that bad, you know, I mean, there are lots of bikes out there of, you know, smaller displacement with four cylinders, you know, I mean, first thing that comes to mind is all the, uh, the 600cc sport bikes, right? Um, so yeah, it, it vibrates a little bit, it's a single cylinder, you know. Um, is it annoying? I wouldn't say so. Now, the blinkers, um, I'm constantly, you know, someone will pull up beside me, yelling out their window at me. We play the game for a little bit, like, what is he saying? Uh, letting me know that my blinker is on, right? So, even when you when you use the blinkers, which I'm, I'm guilty of not using them probably as much as I should, but when I do use them and I, and I cancel them, um, I oftentimes don't cancel them, even though I thought that I did. Um, and you, you really got to push on it hard to get the blinkers to cancel. And I don't often see it because, as you can tell here, it's it's behind the um, the clamp for my wraparound handguard, so I don't often see it when it's blinking, even though I meant to cancel it. It's, you know, but it doesn't catch my eye, so that's one you know, minor annoyance about the bike. Is a lot of times the blinkers don't cancel when you think they will. Um, I like. The fact that the speedo or the, the the display doesn't give you much information, so there's really not a, a lot of reason to look at it. And I like that. So people want more info. Ah, I don't need it. Um, I don't want to be constantly looking at my um, my display and seeing what's going on. Right. So another thing that people or a lot of people do is uh, put a, uh, a steering damper 
Um, mainly, I think Scotts is probably the primarily primary uh, company that most people use for this particular bike. Um, put a, spear, a steering damper on it to kind of uh, fix up those speed wobbles. Uh, I haven't done that yet. I don't know if I'm going to. Um, I spend. I tend to spend my money on the things that I feel are, are going to, I'm going to get the most bang for my buck. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, again, I don't ride this down the freeway all that often. Um, that I, I worry about having a steering stabilizer on it. But if you do, if you are doing riding this in the street all the time, it's probably worth the investment. The Scott's... You know, you have to buy the steering stabilizer, and then, of course, you have to buy the, the mount to adapt it to the bike. So you're looking at about $800, $900 for a new setup. And I, I can spend that 800 bucks on other parts, you know, that I would rather have on the bike. So right now I'm going about 50 miles an hour on, you know, this road goes up and down a little bit. It's, you know, a little hilly, but nothing, nothing severe. But, uh, you know, 50 miles an hour, I'm in sixth gear. And, and that's fine. Um, as long as I don't want to really accelerate, there's no need to shift for me. Um, again, I do have the bigger sprocket in the back. If I did it, maybe it'd be you know, a fifth gear kind of day, but uh, the point being is the bike has plenty of power if you're just cruising around town. That it, there's no need to worry about shifting all the time uh, and when I was talking earlier about having to shift all the time uh, I was really more talking about what I was on uh, up in the mountains either either on pavement or on dirt roads uh, higher altitudes so if there's one thing I dislike about the bike um, I just made a stop and every time you turn the bike off and turn it back on again the traction control re-engages so you got to push the button and it's got to be for exactly five seconds or else the traction control will not turn off. There we go. So now you can see the yellow light, TC. Um, that's kind of annoying, honestly. I, I wish, um, I mean, I know there's a dongle for it. And you can disable it. Um, again, comes back to what do you want to spend your money on, right? And where do you want to spend your time working? But one of so that's 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 an annoyance, but not not something that would turn me off from buying the bike. One of the big um, selling points of this bike is that there are so many options available to customize it the way you want. Um, a lot of people who take this on long stretches of, of road or, or pavement or highway or whatever, they opt to put the tower on the front, right? And there's um, quite a few companies out there that make them. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is, is Raid. They make a they make a really nice tower for the bike. Um, but, you know, again, I, I ride it, most of my street riding is, is to get me to the dirt. So I'm not really interested in that. I don't mind the wind so much. It doesn't bother me, really. Um, there's also the option, uh, of course, you know, Rottweiler, they make a really great air filter um, mod for the bikes so you can put uh, a performance high flow filter and replace this giant air box that's on the front of the bike uh, with a one gallon fuel cell um, also raid i believe they make don't quote me on the company there but uh, i believe it's raid they make a, a an aftermarket filter kit as well where instead of the extra one gallon gas tank you can fit or they sell it comes with the kit um, a, basically a little storage compartment you can put your registration in a set of gloves you know whatever whatever that you know would take up a one gallon space there so that's kind of nice um, there are many options for bags uh, you can use 
just about everybody makes a, a saddlebag kit, you know, Giant Loop, Moscow, um, uh, I'm blanking out, but you know, all the, all the usual suspects that make motorcycle luggage. Um, and then you also have a lot of different rack options. So I've got a tusk rack on the back of this one, um, which I like because it gets my um, Moscow Reckless bags a little bit further back on the bike and away from my, my calves when I'm riding. Um, and almost sort of kind of allows me access to the fuel tank when I need to refuel. Do, do I think that the Power Commander and the Auto-Tune is a worthwhile investment. Absolutely. Um, especially if you're going to be riding in, in town all the time. It just makes it so much more precise and so much more accurate. Yes, you're going to lose a little bit of fuel mileage, but the, the smooth operating that you get from the motor, to me, is totally worth you know, that five, six miles to the gallon that you might lose. So the mods that I've made to the bike, I feel were, were well worth the money. I mean, it's a lot to spend on a single cylinder engine, right? Um, especially if you have four, five, six bikes like I do, you find yourself always spending money on your motorcycles. Um, but the enjoyment I get out of riding this bike around town now, um, I think it's totally worth it. And that's not to say that a stock bike won't be perfectly enjoyable for just about everybody, but you know, most of us guys buy motorcycles or if you're into vehicles, they're never good enough from the factory, right? You start right away just soaking money into them and, and, and uh, making them faster, making them louder, making them cooler. And I'm no different, so, but, uh, I do think that the mods I've made have definitely made this particular motorcycle much, much more fun to ride. Um, the reason that I did all these mods was back in, um, I guess it was in June, I went out to uh, the Silverton Ure area of Colorado here for a Moscow Moto Dusty Lizard meetup or camp out if you will and as I was zipping around the uh, the trails up at you know 12 13,000 feet and they had a lot of really tight switchbacks and hairpins and stuff like that well not hairpins but switchbacks and I would find that even in first gear some of these really steep uh, switchbacks at 13,000 feet the bike was really struggling so I wanted to be able to get out there and power through that stuff better which is why I added the exhaust the power commander the auto tune and eventually the larger rear sprocket Plenty zippy for a single cylinder dual sport it moves out really well most of the time when I'm at the house and I got to run over to the grocery store which is you know just a couple miles away most of the time unless I'm buying a lot of stuff I will always opt to just jump on this because it's so much fun um, it's it's quick enough that I, I don't worry about you know I'm never bored on it um, if there's things in my way I can go over them I can go around them uh, curbs you know, creeks you know, whatever you can always pick yourself a, a faster route um, to wherever you're trying to go right so I do have a lot of fun on this bike if if this was your primary means of conveyance or if you had to pick, pick a dual sport as your primary means of conveyance I would definitely put this on the top of my list I would probably put some different tires on it uh, I, I think most people would 
but otherwise this bike does it all very well again you want to put a windscreen on it to you know you're doing some freeway traveling yeah do it it's not that bad it's pretty easy to work on um, and the bike is easy to work on except for to me having that uh, gas tank in the back really kind of gets in the way of a lot of the stuff you got to do just kind of provides a little few extra steps I guess but it's not too bad